Hello and welcome to the Alabama Public Health Training Network. Thank you for joining us today for our program, Supervision in Healthcare. Program materials, including the handouts, sign-in sheet, and evaluation are all available online. Continuing education credits have been approved for nurses and social workers for today's program. In order to receive credit for this training, you must watch the entire program, then complete and return the sign-in sheet and evaluation. While content may continue to be relevant, continuing education credit will only be awarded for one year for nurses, expiring on January 31, 2018, and two years for social workers, expiring on January 31, 2019. If you want to receive a social work continuing education certificate, you will need to complete the social work test and send it in along with your sign-in sheet and evaluation. I'm Renee Carpenter, State Social Work Director for the Alabama Department of Public Health, and joining me is Sheila Blackshear, former Assistant Social Work Director at ADPH. So welcome back, Sheila. Thanks, Renee. I'm excited to be back at Public Health uh, in Montgomery. This is my old stomping grounds, and to get to talk about a subject I really enjoy, which is supervision. So today we're going to talk about supervision in health care. And let me just start off by asking you all in the audience to just raise your hands. Do you remember your very first supervisor? Do you remember your best supervisor that you've ever had? How many remember the worst you ever had? Okay, all right. Research shows that the relationship between the supervisee and the supervisor is critical for the person to work and function well in the environment and to stay at the agency. So more than ever, we are trying to make sure our supervisors know uh, anything that they can do that will help them as they interact with their supervisees because many people will talk with you about this and say I stayed at this agency because of my supervisor or boy I got away as soon as I could because I got this supervisor. So the role of the supervisor is very important. Uh, let me see how many of you received training before you became a supervisor to be a supervisor. Okay, I have just a couple of hands. And that's very typical. What usually happens is the social worker who does great interaction with clients, gives services, the nurse who is doing quality care with her or his patients, is recognized and is then moved into a position to be a supervisor. And people just think it's an automatic. But the skill set is very different. How we interact with clients and patients, yes, some of those same types of interactions are great to do with our supervisees. But there are a lot more things to it. I asked to get access to this Alabama Department of Public Health to show how the chain of command is in your organization. And one of the things I found very helpful when I was at Public Health was everybody had access to this and everybody knew who their supervisor was and who was next in the chain of command. I recently talked with people about supervision in an agency uh, that gives uh, medical type care and there was a director of nursing, but no middle management nurses, and a director of social work, but no middle management social workers. And I found the people who were given direct care had many questions, uh, were requesting information, and didn't feel that they were getting the supervision they needed. Because, of course, if you supervise 50 to 75 people, you're not going to be able to give individual time and attention to them. So as agencies get away from middle management, I think that causes its own set of problems. But public health uh, has a beautiful showing of 
how you will fall under which department and who is next in line. So uh, that's a beautiful picture to me. So what do we need from supervisors? Why do we even need supervisors? Now, if you look at this, uh, we're going to start at the top. Do you need to manage cases and make decisions? So if you are a new employee, your supervisor may meet with you and talk about all your cases, a certain number of your cases to make sure that uh, you are getting appropriate care and you are making appropriate decisions with your clients or patients. You also need to be able to manage your career development. As you hire somebody, you may say to them, where would you like to be in five years or ten years? And what we've discovered in supervision is if we pay attention to that, if we really do try to help that person grow and develop in their profession, they're more likely to maintain at our same agency. If it's just you're hired in for this job and for the next 40 years we would like you to continue to do this. That can lead to burnout, frustration, lots of problems. The nice thing I saw, another nice thing at ADPH, is that you all have so many programs that if you work in a program for a period of time, you start uh, feeling that you may be burning out, you may be stressed, whatever, then often there's an opportunity where you can go into a different program. And I think that's why ADPH is also able to maintain a lot of the same staff because you don't have to stay in the same position forever. You can move into different programs. Um, the need to manage emotional impact of the work. There's a lot written today, and many of you who have worked in health know it's very stressful just complying with all the regulations, uh, the confidentiality, all the things that we have to do, and to know that sort of in an inward way so that all your behaviors that you do with the client or the patient are a part of that, be it HIPAA, OSHA regs, whatever. So there are many, many things that you have to manage and the impact can be very stressful. If you work in a clinic and people come in who do not have money for food and basic necessities, it's great to be doing family planning with them, but as a nurse, as a social worker, you know that person may need other things. So hopefully things are developed, and I saw that in clinics, that may help refer them to food sources, clothing sources, whatever they might need for their family. Um, I need to reflect on practice and improve performance. It's hard, but supervisors somehow have to be able to assess the work of all their workers. A lot of times we do it by reading the charts and see what people document, but it's also helpful if we can get an opportunity to observe in person how do they interact. Even if it is as you are walking to the restroom or out to a meeting and you observe the RN, the social worker as they are initially seeing the client, how they're interacting, or as they're walking the client out. All of that will give you some clues as to how that relationship is building with that person. A need to inform and discuss change. In any institution, but certainly one as large as public health, change is going to be happening frequently. When I worked at Public Health quite a few years back, I was really impressed that all of a sudden ADPH was informed that we would no longer be able to have a certain program. It was awarded to another agency and we had 30 days to get out of that program. The agency very quickly discovered a different program that they could transfer all those employees into and get that program planned with policies, procedures, everything, so that nobody lost a single day of work. 
what great planning. And I, I must admit, this is the only agency I ever saw do that, and they did it really well. Uh, I hate that we had to because there was a beautiful program they were doing uh, that just happened to be awarded to another agency. So a lot of times change is going to be happening, and you as the supervisor have to help individuals that you supervise to accept the change, even if you may not be happy about it. And many times as a supervisor, you may not be. I need to combine or to contribute to service development. Sometimes as you see your supervisees delivering services, you may see uh, problems with time management. You may see problems with the flow of the clinic, things like that. And as a supervisor, you can assess, analyze, and come up with a different process to hopefully improve things for both the workers and the clients. And I saw that a great deal at public health. A need to manage projects and to delegate. That's one of the hard things that you learn as a supervisor. Delegation. How many of you worked for somebody who would not delegate and insisted they had to do it all themselves? Anybody? How many of you worked for the king or queen of delegation? The workers take bets on is she painting her fingernails or her toenails in the office because she's not doing anything with clients, she's not doing anything with us? What is she doing? There are no meetings going on. So it's an important thing to remember to balance delegation. Some delegation is good. If everything becomes a delegated activity, then that will ruin your relationship with your supervisees. I must admit, I never saw an ADPH supervisor painting their toenails, but it does happen at some agencies. Um, I need to manage personal and professional development. It's important that all of our supervisees, our workers know that there is the ADPH world, but there's also a lot of other things they need to be aware of. It may be professional obligations, professional administration things from nursing, from social work, uh, and you as a supervisor have to help get that information, make it appealing to your workers, make them aware of a service organization they could participate in, make them aware of a service organization they could contact to help their clients. All those kinds of things we do as kind of an extra in our supervision. You need to manage personal and professional development and need to integrate training and coaching. Those are some of the new buzzwords in supervision. We do training, but we also do coaching. So we make sure they know what the task is, and as they do parts of it well, we are almost like a cheerleader, urging them on to do more and more and better until they are able to do whatever the new skill set is. Uh, I need to manage the caseload. If you can think back to your very first job and you walk in and they tell you, we have 120 clients for you and they're only six weeks behind, so dig in and I'm sure you'll catch up in a week or two. Well, that's enough to run many new employees away because that's a lot. And yet most times, my experience in agencies is they don't hire before somebody leaves. So after there's an opening, then there's a hiring, and that person comes in behind before they even start. So you see many, many roles for supervisors, uh, many tasks that we do. So how do we define supervision? It's an accountable process which supports, assures, and develops knowledge, skills, and values of the individual, the group, or the team. So, I've never seen a book of information on how to document supervision, 
and yet I do think it's very important. Some of you will be doing group supervision, so there may be uh, minutes of your group meeting, but certainly an individual. It's important to keep notes, not necessarily patient names, but the process, what the worker is learning. Uh, this can come in handy if you're going to do an accommodation for someone or a commendation for someone, but it also comes in handy if somebody is not doing their job and we have to have good documentation to show that. Part of supervision is documenting errors and problems. Uh, the purpose is to improve the quality of their work to achieve agreed objectives and outcomes. So we want patients and clients to receive quality treatment and we want them to be able to come back and want to come back because it is a positive work environment. Three of the competencies in any type of supervision, you may be supervising people, uh, the secretaries, you may be supervising financial personnel or social work and nurses. And we have to always be aware of recruitment. How do we get some of the best employees? Some of the best ways is including things like having really good social workers, really good nurses spread the word among their competent professional friends that there's an opening and they might want to apply. And of course we do the basics, uh, advertising in appropriate uh, newspapers, journals, whatever. Then training, evaluating each person, see what kind of training they need, trying to give basic training to everybody, but specific to meet the needs of different levels of workers you may uh, supervise. Retention is a very big issue. If you spend six months to a year giving supervision, uh, making sure they know policies and procedures and they go to another job, that's a lot of money that was invested in that worker. Uh, so the more workers we can retain, even if they're not perfect, and really no workers are perfect, if we can keep them in the quality that we need, always working on improvement, then the retention rate will handle itself. So recruitment issues. As a state agency, for many years, uh, we have had the understanding that the state salaries don't start really high, but if you remain in the state system, if you remain employed and have good uh, evaluations, then you will be able to achieve a good salary and then good retirement. Uh, if there are low salaries, that means people will have to work multiple jobs and they may be tired by the time they get to ADPH because they worked uh, the midnight shift at the nursing home or they go after five and work at a nursing home or other facility. So the more we can keep our salary, salaries competitive, the better off the whole agency is. Benefits for very young employees, a lot of times they don't come in in their 20s asking about retirement. That's not something they're concerned about. They're looking more at salary hours, which public health areas will I be working in, will I have to travel, those kinds of things. Again, the highest turnover rate will be if you have employees who are at lower continuum of income. The private sector is always wanting well-trained professionals, nurses, social workers to come to their agencies. So many times our staff could be recruited when I was at ADPH for other agencies. Training is really important, and we start with orientation. You need to have a very thorough, involved orientation that helps them understand the context of the job. One of the nice things about public health when I came and was trained was I was allowed to visit some of the different programs. I had no idea 
of the vast programs. I always knew about immunizations, basic things that I think everybody knows about. But I didn't know we had specialized programs for hepatitis C patients. We had special grants that might cover diabetes, asthma, whatever. So those specialty things are so important. And a well-informed employee can take advantage and refer their patients and clients to those. Stress management on the job, if possible, try to pair a new employee with someone that you think would be a good mentor, somebody who manages stress, someone who doesn't run from the room when there is an issue, a problem, a blow up with a patient. They stand and continue to talk until they can help that patient client get under control. Um, and have lots of interpersonal skills that they can view this person using. Now sometimes they can get this from the supervisor, but your time is very valuable. You can't spend all that much time with an individual, but you can expose them to other workers that are quite competent. Also, I noticed in public health, we did a lot of shadowing, so you could let a new employee go and observe. It's one thing to read the policies and procedures on how to interact with clients and, and how to run a clinic, but to see it in action and to see it in several different counties gives them a very good understanding of how that could work. Always assess your worker, try to understand where they are, Try not to give them tasks early on that are beyond their understanding and competencies. But as they work for you, those can increase and they can get more and more responsibilities. In-services can often be uh, conducted that will meet needs. If you notice five of your six employees have an issue with HIPAA rigs or with confidentiality or a particular medical procedure, then an in-service in that can cover all your workers and you can feel com confident that they're increasing skills. You have to be aware of the professional demands. One of the reasons we're doing this uh, educational program on supervision uh, Social Work Board now requires three hours of continuing education on supervision if you do supervision. Um, and although it does, you don't have to have it until 2018, if you actually get the requirement in 2017, you can count it as you are doing your licensure renewals. Certainly there are certain topics that all staff have to know, be it CPR, hand washing, whatever. But also, in terms of medications, the nurses have to know certain requirements. Social workers may concentrate more on resources, how can we get free medications for someone, where can we refer them that they can rece receive those resources. Mentoring programs are a wonderful way to help your staff get involved, to achieve the goals of the clinic, of the agency, uh, as they see workers who already have skills beyond what they do, they're often going to want to be with that person and get more information. Retention, this is very big. Human Resources talks a lot about how we can retain the workforce and some of the intrinsic things uh, that a supervisor can do is to recognize supervisees in some way. And it may be on your anniversary day, you get a card from your supervisor that says, it, especially the things that you are really good at performing and doing and thanks you for your service to the agency. It may be celebrating birthdays, giving birthday cards. It may be on Fridays the agency says you can wear a football jersey uh, for the team of your choice and the 
agency can allow staff to kind of loosen up, be comfortable. They may wear blue jeans and Auburn, Alabama, whatever t-shirts. And this can help a lot with having fun at work, that it's not always critical medical issues, that sometimes we can have fun. Whenever possible, grant leave. This is something I hear a lot of concern about. Uh, if you are the supervisor, uh, try to schedule uh, vacations that your staff requests, uh, leave days, uh, as much as you can. And when you can't, give them the rationale. I would love to let you off that day, but I've got three other uh, people who have already requested it. So could you choose another day or whatever? Uh, staff is very quick to notice, are you off every holiday? Are you as a supervisor off for weeks at a time? Uh, and I have heard supervisors talk about 10 years down the line, they get a phone call from somebody they used to supervise, and the person may say, you know, I didn't realize what a great supervisor you were until I'm now working for another agency, and they really don't care when I want to be off. They don't really care when I burn out. And you made it clear if we were at that point, if we needed a mental health day, you would work with us to try to give us time off. That is really important. And they may not recognize it so much initially, but certainly as they're moving up in your agency or others, they will remember those kinds of things, just as you all very quickly remembered who was the best supervisor you had, who was the worst supervisor. Whenever possible, make positive comments about your supervisees in organizational-wide meetings. This is really great for morale. It's also just positive, courteous behaviors. If you have an employee that is having difficulties, do not bring that up in any type meeting. That will be something you'll deal with individually with that person. But by being positive, speaking up about nurses, uh, this is something I want to report on Nurses Week. I got this much help from all the RNs, uh, whatever achievements they've done, recognize that. And in social work as well, it's really important. Uh, always treat your workers with professional respect. You may be very angry and upset about something that someone did, but remember, they will mirror your professionalism. Always try to have a positive supervisory meeting. You are a coach, a teacher, a leader. Uh, I talked in an earlier training about the sandwich approach where we do a positive comment or statement about an employee. And then in the middle, we sandwich in any problems that they need to work on, be it time management, be it arriving late to work, be it being behind on paperwork, whatever. And then as they are about to leave, make sure you sandwich in another positive. So they leave your office with an upbeat attitude that, well, I may be behind on my paperwork, but he or she recognizes that when I do have it in, it's very thorough, uh, and that I set a good example by coming in on time or whatever. So. They have very positive feelings along with, okay, I've got to work on something else. Because if all we do in one supervisory session is talk about the negatives, they're going to leave feeling defeated and not feel comfortable in attempting to do better. I have supervised a lot of individuals through the years. I've had a couple of individuals who frankly had PTSD from previous supervision. If I would see the person in the hallway and say, could you stop by my office for just a minute when you have time, they would arrive in my office physically shaking. What did I do wrong? I'm happy to do anything to correct it. Just tell me. I'm like, I wanted to tell you what a good job you did on something. After several years, that person was able to come to my office 
not be shaking, not assume I was calling her down on something. That was a lot of time it took her, and she was so stressed based on supervision she had received in another agency that was just one year employment. But if every time you go in you're getting negative, you can see how that can play into people's difficulties. So try to be a positive coach, leader, and teacher, and use constructive criticism, constructive criticism when it's warranted. So what do we look at with retention? It's really important for the person to know what is expected of him or her. Hence, many supervisors take out the job description, go over, these are the expectations, these are the things I will be looking at, and then at the yearly evaluation, these same things come up again. What materials and equipment are needed for the job? As a supervisor, part of your role is to make sure they have what they need. Through the years, I've worked at a lot of state agencies. Many times did not have the um, office kinds of things that I needed. So when I came to work at ADPH in Montgomery, I arrived with a box. And my new supervisor said, well, Sheila, you brought a whole box of things? I said, yes, I want to be able to work thoroughly today. And inside that box was my stapler, uh, all the things I needed on my desk. And she's like, you can take those home. We have those here. I had no idea. All the state agencies where I had worked, I had to bring things from home. One agency, at the end of the financial year, we had to bring toilet tissue to make sure we had that. So what we learn in previous agencies, we bring to ADPH when we come. So just be aware, some of your workers may be used to having to provide everything, and others may have more realistic expectations, which is the job should provide what is needed. We want to give them opportunities to do some of the things that they do best. If they tell you they really enjoy working with elderly, if they can be in a program working with a lot of elderly, that's great. But sometimes they may have to cover, cover other areas, and so they may need some instruction, some support in the other areas. They need to know somebody at work cares for them. Sounds pretty basic, doesn't it? And yet, there are some supervisors who may not ask, did you have a good Christmas vacation? I saw in the paper your child received a special award at school. I know you must be proud. That takes just a minute or two, but it shows not only you're looking at their records and seeing what they're doing, but you're also recognizing they are an individual who has a family, who has other concerns. Now, we don't need to get involved in too much of that, but to have some level of understanding. So if somebody's going through a crisis, we can be aware, uh, assist if needed. And if somebody has something to celebrate, let's help them celebrate. Your child just got accepted to Harvard. You know, I think balloons or cupcakes or something is in order because not every family has that wonderful thing to celebrate. And by doing that, we're saying you're very important personally and professionally. They also need to feel their opinions count. So if you have to listen to multiple complaints about certain areas, that's really important. And sometimes we have to say as mid-managers, that is really good information. I'm happy to share it up the line. But you know, I'm not sure the agency at this point in time will make changes. Anything you can think of that would help you work better with patients, let me know and I will pass that up the line. So we're realistic, but it's important they know they're heard. As a supervisor, you will induct the person, get them started, and place them in whatever program is appropriate. Sometimes you may hire somebody and tell them they will be working in a certain program, uh, and then when they come to work, 
maybe that program no longer needs them, so you're going to have to move them into another one. Hopefully, the explanation you give will help them understand. You know, our goal is to save your job, and since there's not one in this program, we've worked it out where you can work here. And most people will be quite happy about that. Explaining supervision. What do you need from them? In social work, if they're working on a particular license, we have to meet weekly for an hour or once a month for four hours. And so it's important to let the supervisee know, bring your questions, bring a case, so they don't sit back and say, okay, I'm ready for you to give me all the insights, because that's not supervision. It's a give and take. But they may have not had an appropriate supervisor before, so you may be explaining that to somebody who has not experienced it. You, as a supervisor, will do work planning, the work assignment, and delegation. Delegation is a big deal, and we'll talk about that some more shortly. You also have to monitor, review, and evaluate the work. Uh, I have on occasion had super, uh, students who tell me their supervisors told them to do QA evaluations of workers in the agency. Now. Since they were not on the same line as those workers, they really did not have the skills to evaluate. So sometimes you may have to evaluate and say, okay, an assistant, uh, a coworker may evaluate a chart, but it doesn't need to be somebody who has less qualifications than the person who has done the actual activity. Um, you can't do it all yourself, but make sure you carefully delegate to someone who can. So many tasks you do, such as coordinating work, uh, communication function. Wow, that is big, especially in this agency that has so many employees, so many policies, and things can change very quickly. Uh, so the communication has to go through the discipline, sometimes through the uh, multidisciplinary team, and it's so important that everybody who needs to be notified is. Uh, you also advocate for your supervisees. Uh, yes, it would be great if they all worked the week before Christmas and the week after, but since they do have families, they do have small children, perhaps there's a way we can make sure everybody gets partial time off. Uh, and when you go to administration, always have a plan, an idea to offer, rather than this is the problem, how is administration going to fix it? Uh, you will be known as a very good supervisor and someone who advocates well for your supervisees. You can be a change agent, a community liaison. As people meet with you and know you in the community, uh, although you don't have public health written on your forehead, uh, most communities know who works at public health and who to approach if they have a public health question. Many people say, I don't want to be a supervisor. I don't want the stress. So let's look at these stresses that are typical for supervisees. The, the worker is concerned about all the demands by administration, that they perform a certain way, they comply with all regulations, policies, and procedures. Especially in the beginning, there are so many things to learn, and it's very easy for people to make errors. I think as a cooperative uh, supervisor, we can let them know when they make errors, but let them know this is very typical with new workers. I don't get concerned uh, when this happens in the first month of employment or whatever short time frame. We also have a lot of educational requirements in supervision. Uh, if you see somebody does not know some information, then you can hopefully come up with some type of training or education for them, either individually or the whole group may need it. I've never heard many uh, nurses or social workers say, 
the clients are my big stress. What they often say is, it's my co-workers. If they would just be okay, I can give service to the clients. But my co-workers are pulling on me. They're saying uh, there's too many demands, and then they're making demands. So many times, the clients are not the stressor. However, for some, the clients are. The relationship with the supervisor. The supervisor needs to know that you are impartial, that you make same kinds of policy decisions for everybody that comes in your office. Uh, it's not, I will give Meg two weeks at Christmas because I like her, and Glenda gets two days because I really don't like her. You know, those kinds of things can be seen in your decision making, so it needs to be perfectly clear that there are above board reasons for why you do the things that you do. Um, there's also the nature and organizational context of professional task. I was in a meeting at Public Health many years ago, and uh, a very well-respected nutritionist got up and said, I know that if people would have one ounce of alcohol a day, it would be medically a positive for them. And the head of public health at that time said, you know that, I know that, but if you ever say that on TV or in a big group of people, it will ruin us at public health because there are so many people who do not believe in alcohol use. So even though it's true, the context of public health is we're not going to take that battle on. And she was very respectful. She said, yes, I understand that and I won't. But in this meeting of ADPH employees that I needed to say that. And he said, I totally agree. It would help so many people with medical issues. But just please do not say that in a public area. Again, the context is very important. So what kinds of supervision can you give? People who have done supervision for a long time have many different types of supervision that they employ depending on the who the supervisee is, what they will respond best to, as well as what the issue is and how much help they can give. So supportive is one that I think we all can use. We always want to be supportive of our employees. The systems approach is also very helpful. You identify what in the system may be causing a problem. Not who, but what in the system. Is it the way clients are allowed to wander the halls causes difficulties in getting to the appointments and causes problems for people uh, who are waiting in the hallway? And problem solving. Those are three types. There are many types, but those are the ones I thought it could apply to all types of supervisors. So when you're doing problem solving, you want to identify the problem collect information and uh, analyze it, prioritize and set objectives, outline the plan of action, and then implement the plan. Uh, I saw Jefferson County Public Health did a wonderful job. Uh, at one point they had a very low rate of clients showing up for appointments for uh, family planning and they talked to the clients, they talked to the workers and they had to schedule four to six weeks in advance to get on the schedule. Our clients did not know would they have transportation, would they have a sick kid that day, would they be able to get off work, so many variables that people who have regular jobs and sick leave and all don't even think about. So they set it up where clients had to call between 7 and 8 a.m. to get an appointment that day. So when they did that, 
the cancellation rate decrease, the no-show rate decrease. They were having 85 to 90 percent of their clients coming in because they could predict in the next eight hours what they could do. They could not predict. So what seemed to be a good thing for us as schedulers, as people at public health, was not good for the clients. So by adjusting the system, and that to me is a really good example of problem solving. If there's a problem with people not complying with their medical care, look and see what it is. I think the nurses, I think the social workers, the physicians all got together and devised this new plan. Supportive supervision, again, the caring interest and concern. Know your workers. Know if they're married, divorced, single, if they have children, grandchildren. Uh, not to be nosy, but just to show a positive interest. It's important to develop the safe and trusting relationship. If they have PTSD from supervision, you're going to help them work through it. Uh, reassurance and encouragement. Uh, sometimes a new program is started and you are gifted employees that come kicking and screaming. They don't want to be in your program. They don't want to be there. But of course they want jobs. They need to feed their families. And so you as a supervisor have to help them work through that. Yes, it is a shame that you're not getting to work in the program you want. But eventually help them see how lucky they are that they do have jobs, that they can continue to work, and that if they want to transfer in another area of public health, it may be possible in the future. Try to always recognize any achievement, give positive reinforcement. Uh, we can't give big raises. We can't say, here's a bonus check for $1,000. Thanks for all the neat stuff you did this month. But for many people, uh, a simple card that outlines what they are thanking you for, a recognition of all the extra things you do, can mean a lot. Many workers I see keep those cards, keep that recognition in a certain drawer in their desk. And when they're having a bad day, when nothing is going well, they open that drawer, they can read that card, and that keeps them going. Catharsis ventilation. Sometimes as supervisors we have to sit and listen as supervisees may rant and rave about some client, some conditions in a house, some lack of services for people who are impoverished and need things and nobody is helping them. We've all been there. We've all been frustrated with either our clients or the system or whatever. And listening, not trying to fix it, but listening and then eventually getting down to, is there a plan? Is there something that can be done to help them? Sometimes just the listening is what they're asking for. When you're doing supportive supervision, uh, it's important to sometimes help desensitize and help universalize some situations. I see this in group supervision. If you have someone complaining about an issue, I went out to the home and uh, the client uh, was uh, partially naked or completely naked and I had to go in and somehow get him or her to dress and then try to provide services and they don't pay me enough to go see naked people that I don't choose to see. Well, probably not. We don't. Uh, and But as other workers talk about, you know, that happened to me a month ago. That happened to me my first month on the job. It helps them see this is a universal experience. Not a good experience, not what they want, but it is something that happens and kind of helps bring down the drama the problem with it, and they can all share that this was a shared experience. Uh, always try to be sensitive to worker stressors. Uh, if there is a suicide of a client, if there is a suicide of a patient, uh, if there's a suicide of a coworker, 
that's going to be a time when your supervisees will need extra support from you. And you will be good at figuring out what would be the best type of support. Is it arranging uh, who's going to take meals to the family at a certain time? Is it bringing in cupcakes for everybody? Uh, whatever would help relieve a little of the stress. And sensitive humor. If you can uh, tell something funny, if you can help people approach things a little differently, uh, that can mean all the difference in the world. That can be sticky because if somebody interprets it that you are making fun of them, which is not your intent, uh, it, that can be problematic. So try to make sure it's the situation that's humorous, not uh, the person. The systems approach is another approach that can be used. And the tasks that are listed here for that approach include you have to monitor and evaluate. So look at records, observe, however you monitor. Uh, you ex instruct and advise the supervisee. You model professional behaviors and skills. They see you interacting positively when administrators are on board. They see you interacting positively with clients who may be angry, upset, screaming, yelling, whatever. Uh, and when you do that with uh, coworkers as well. Um, also, case consultation. If you hear through the grapevine that somebody's having a problem with a particular client, uh, with a particular area, uh, be it uh, something in family planning, be it uh, domestic violence, whatever, then try to network with that person, talk with them about it, maybe connect one supervisee with another one who has a lot of training and expertise in working with domestic violence. Uh, or if somebody has to report abuse of elderly or of children, that can be very difficult and sometimes giving extra support during that time is also good. So you see how all these three just kind of intertwine and you can use parts of each one. If you're a new supervisor, the biggest stress I see is transition from worker to supervisor. You're real comfortable with being a worker. And now you don't have a caseload, but you're supposed to stay busy for eight hours supervising. What does that mean? What does that entail? So your self-perception, your identity as a worker is kind of in flux when this first happens. You have increased authority. You can decide somebody's not doing their job, write them up, and their yearly evaluation, they don't get a good evaluation. On the other hand, uh, this may be an excellent worker, but the previous supervisor, for whatever reason, didn't recognize it. So you can, and you can be very positive and report uh, the positive things they're doing. One of the hardest things that I see is people who are direct care workers who suddenly become supervisors and are supervising their friends, their former co-workers. You can't be a friend to somebody you supervise. It doesn't work. You can be friendly. You can ask, how's the family? Did you have a good weekend? Kind of what I call super superficial social chat. But you can't say, oh, let's all go to lunch. Oh, let's stay an hour and a half. We, we deserve it. We had a hard clinic, you know. We can no longer do any of those things, and that's very hard. It becomes a lonely life as a supervisor many times, and many people don't foresee this happening. I can be a supervisor, and I can supervise my friends. Not really. You can't. Um, how many of you were promoted to a supervisory position and had to supervise friends? Okay. Was that some rough days ahead? Very, very rough. Very rough. Mm -hmm. I have 
done almost therapy with people in those positions and let them cry and express their sadness that they're having to leave friends behind uh, because you essentially cannot be a friend. Uh, it changes uh, the dynamics in the relationship and you don't want it to necessarily, but that's what's required on the job to be a supervisor. There's a lot of pressure for exemplary behavior. At one of the jobs where I was uh, director of social work, my boss told me if I was one minute late, I would be reprimanded. And if I was two minutes late a second time, she would have to fire me. I had never been told that before. I lived in fear of what if I have a tire that goes out? I allow enough time to get to work, but I don't allow enough time to change a tire, so am I going to be fired? Well, on the day that I found myself about to go in front of a train to make sure I would not be late to work, I thought, this is too much stress. I can't do this. If she fires me, she fires me. I'm not going to jump the tracks. Uh, but. She felt she had to make everything equal. The folks who signed in by clocking in were punished if they were late. Uh, I did not have to clock in. I could work 16-hour days, and that was fine. But uh, I didn't have to clock in. But she had to be totally above board and have everybody go by the same rules. That was her explanation. Uh, that was a difficult time for me. Uh, I wasn't typically late, but I lived in great fear of being late. Um, middle management muddle, uncertainty about supervisory roles. I couldn't find a really cute clip art. I wanted to have one of somebody's hair being totally pulled up by administration and their feet being pulled down by the people that they're supervising and they're stretched to the max because that's how many people describe to me how they feel in mental management positions. You're supposed to please the folks above you, but then you're also supposed to keep the folks you supervise very happy. You know, we can't keep people happy all the time. It doesn't work. So many expectations for supervisors. So why the heck did we decide we'd be a supervisor? These are some of the satisfactions that people have. Let's see how many of you have similar ones. Do you enjoy helping your supervisees grow and develop? Is that kind of an intrinsic thing that you get out of it? Okay. Uh, ensuring efficient and effective services to your clients. If you see something that can be improved, you may can initiate a change with your workers, with the clinic, however, so that it goes smoother and works better for everyone. You can share your knowledge and skills with supervisees. Um, you can also recommend and sometimes actually affect changes in policies and procedures. Not always. Maybe occasionally. But if you are in the know and policies and procedures that are about to be considered for change and you can quickly get some data from your workers and show when they do this, they're 90% effective when they do this, it falls to 50%. Ah, which way should we go? So if you can get black and white numbers, often administration will look at that. Um, receiving stimulation of curious, enthusiastic supervisees. How many of you in here have had students? Okay. By having students, you get somebody usually who's enthusiastic, excited about learning, question, well, why is this a policy? Why can't I put a client in my car and take them to the grocery store? Why can't I do this or that? And it helps us rethink, how did we get that policy? Is that still the best policy, or do we need to look at it? 
so I think a lot of times when we have new blood, be it students, new employees, it really keeps us on our toes as supervisors. What do we dislike as a supervisor? Red tape, audits, timesheets, statistical reports. Who thought that when you became a supervisor, you would have to sit at a desk and do so many reports and so many things when as a direct care worker, you were out in the field seeing your clients or they were coming into clinic and you were having that personal interaction that many times professionals really enjoy. Uh, I don't have a real good personal relationship with my computer. It's okay. I deal with it. I can do my reports, but I don't get a genuine thrill out of it. I do get a thrill out of talking with the family, talking with the client, seeing their situations improve. So you have to kind of adjust your expectations and view big picture. This is what's important to keep the supervisees going. This is what's important to the clients. I'm just kind of a level back. Sometimes the responsibilities you have take time away from your supervisees, and you know they need more time. Uh, I had a friend that would try to call me when I worked at ADPH, and I would say, sorry, I was in a meeting, and I called back four hours later or five hours later. And the next day, sorry, I was in a meeting. And he said, how many meetings do you go to? I said, a lot. How many days? Every day we're in some kind of meeting. You know, if we're lucky, it's a one or two hour meeting. If not, it may go on extended. How do you stand it? Well, you stand it because some of the issues are so very important that you want to make sure your discipline is represented, your clients and supervisees are represented by you. Uh, some may not seem as important to you, but you have to go through that to get to the more important. A loss of direct contact with clients. I've seen people go in supervisory positions and ask to go back to be a worker because they're just not happy with some of these kinds of issues. So as a supervisor, you may be dissatisfied when you have to enforce a policy and procedure that you totally don't agree with. And again, some of the people I have admired the most in supervisory positions have said, this may not be what you agree with. It might not even be my preference. I'm not going to say. But it's policy, and each of us, by making a commitment to this agency, these clients, has to go with policy. Once we try this, if there are problems, I am happy to give that information to administration above me and see if any changes can be made. But at this point, this is the policy, so we have to do this. That's hard to do, especially if it's folks that have been your friends, that you have been able to say in years past, this is silly, why are they making us do this? You cannot take that role anymore. And we all enjoy our clients as well as our supervisees who are open to direction, who request uh, criticism if they need it. It's very hard sometimes to supervise people who don't want to be supervised, who are resistive to supervision. Sometimes they're hostile about it. Sometimes, uh, again, they may be dependent. Again, sometimes I've had people say, I'd like supervision every day. Really? I mean, that is overkill. Uh, and some people, you have to go over the same procedures many times before they're able to fully understand and carry that through. And yet, as a supervisor, that's our responsibility. Being tied down to the desk and office is a complaint I often hear from people who are supervisors. So look at this stress supervisor. These are some of the issues that come up 
when you are supervising that are possible stressful areas. The gender, if the person you supervise is a different gender from you, sometimes issues come up. It may be a little harder for you to understand what they're talking about, or they may have trouble understanding what you're talking about, just because males and females in some areas think differently. Now, we're used to, in the workplace, we have male social workers, we have male nurses, and have uh, female social workers and nurses. But in certain situations, that can be an issue that comes up. Race. This is Alabama. We, if you grew up in Alabama, we all have certain biases. Hopefully, as professionals, we have looked at that. We are able to get through any biases, any stereotypes about race. Uh, sometimes not. Uh, and that needs to be identified if it's a problem. And you can talk with your supervisor. Uh, I, I see that sometimes, but it, at this point, it seems in healthcare we are pretty good at accepting all of our employees and having positive relationships within that. Ethnicity, if uh, our supervisees and or clients have different values, different ideas about things, uh, it may be based on ethnic issues, and just talking about that sometimes makes a difference. Um, at one point, I kept on my door. Um, at Christmas, I would have Merry Christmas cards. I'd have Happy Hanukkah, and then I would have Rosh Hashan. And so one of the guys that I supervised said, how do you know about this stuff? And I said, well, part of being a supervisor is knowing about cultural diversity and respecting all the people that I supervise. And I have people of very different faiths, very different ideas, and I want them to know I respect them. And one way is to certainly interact with them. But just by having that on my door, I got lots of comments and questions about that. It seemed a very basic thing to me. Uh, sexual orientation, sometimes that can enter into it. Uh, just be aware. Sometimes our supervisees may have issues and concerns if they are seeing a client of a particular orientation. Uh, and sometimes they have doubts about, am I covering all the things I need to because I'm not sure if I am or not. Uh, in STD clinics or people covering all the issues that need to be covered if it is somebody of a different sexual orientation. And oftentimes a good discussion in supervision, a good discussion with the client can help ensure that all issues are being covered that need to be. So. Everybody in here wants to be a good supervisor and probably is. The things that we know through research that helps is if you can project an attitude of confidence and trust toward your supervisee. Now sometimes you can do that and sometimes there's a saying in AA, fake it till you make it. So sometimes I've had to fake that I had every confidence in somebody I was supervising if I knew, based on evaluations, things I had observed, that they might not be the quality that I wanted them to be. And if so, then I just need to continue to work with that person and observe. And it may be inaccurate on my part, or it may be that, yes, they just need a little more supervision. Um, always try to give praise positive for anything uh, that the person does well. And if they don't do something well, that they attempted it and they reported to you, I'm not comfortable, I don't think I did a good job, what can I do? 
well, I want to commend you for coming in and talking to the supervisor about this. You know, you don't want to shove this under the rug because it is important and you recognize it and we'll work on this together. At that point, the person knows you are supportive, you're going to do some problem solving with them, and it's a positive win-win. I always try to be sensitive to the worker's stress and be flexible to adjust work accordingly. I know that everybody who has a caseload at public health has a big one. We don't give little ones at public health. Didn't when I was here, and I feel sure that hasn't changed, Renee. No, it hasn't. Okay. So that's not easy to do. But if your worker uh, suddenly has a child who dies, or suddenly has a spouse that dies, or whatever loss, and you know that person is stressed out, you can go to the workers, other workers, and say, okay. I'm just trying to think of some ways we can help this person when they come back that first week. Is there anything you can think of that uh, I could do, you could do, whatever? And I've seen interdisciplinary groups come up with something, a plan. Well, why don't we interview new clients and just let her have her old ones? Or perhaps she doesn't want to see her old ones because they know her and they will know, reading the paper, she's the worker whose spouse or child died. So then maybe give her new ones that won't know her and she'll be more comfortable with that. So sometimes we can do things. As a supervisor, you can't typically take over a caseload. But if you can help in some way, that really shows you are supporting the team and the worker, and that makes a big statement to everybody so that they will be even doing more for you and the agency as needed. I remember one time asking a supervisor why she was suddenly coming up with some things negative that I was doing uh, that when I was interviewed for the job, I'd ask about uh, some flexibility and it was like, oh yeah, you get all the flexibility you want. I don't care when you come in, just do the job. And I thought, wow, have I gotten the right job. First week on the job, that flexibility left. Uh, I was to arrive. 30 minutes early and work several hours over each night. What about that and flexibility? So I said, did I get confused on the interview? I thought there was going to be some flexibility. Well, I knew that's what a good supervisor would say, so I said it. So you said it, but you didn't mean it. That's right. So please consider when you say something, try to mean what you say and not just try to be a good super, sound like a good supervisor because that can backfire. I did not remain on that job real long. Okay, so it's important to be open to negative feedback and constructive criticism. We give these to our supervisees, but we have to be willing to take it too. And I've been in group supervision uh, where uh, I thought, oh, please, dear God, let me get out of here without too much blood coming out of my back because I was being attacked in so many areas. And I learned how to take it, and I learned how to say, okay, so what do you want different? What, what would be an improvement? Uh, and eventually, uh, we came to terms with some things. These were people who were forced to come and work for me at an agency they did not want to work at. So it was sort of like whatever I said wasn't good. So after a few months of listening to their complaints and concerns, we sort of worked out a deal. If they would work for me, and do the best job for the clients. When a year had passed, I would try to get any and all of them returned to the agency that had made them come to me. And at the end of that year, I only had one that decided she wanted to go back. And I was able to do that. One could go back. All eight 
I don't know if they'd all want to go back. I would probably have had to resign at that point. But you don't know as you're super, supervising folks how they will react to lots of different things. So try to be open to constructive criticism of whatever you say or do. We have to be supportive of workers' private issues, but not intrusive. Uh, sometimes supervisors, supervisees tell us way too much. I need the day off because I'm finally going to meet this man that I've been contacting online for the last six months and we're in love and so I'm going to meet him and I have a hotel reservation. Really? Uh, just just a, a request for a day off is fine. I, I really don't need all that. So sometimes we have to help set boundaries because not everybody knows their personal life needs to remain personal. So what does the agency expect of a good supervisor? They want you to be comfortable with authority and power. They want you to be able to say, this is the way it is to your workers, and they will follow your instructions. To get to that point, you have to have gone through the trenches of a lot of things, a lot of support, a lot of problem solving with the folks you supervise. Um, and hopefully uh, then you can use your authority and power in a positive way. Uh, again, the importance of policies and procedures and have to be able to integrate agency goals with worker morale and emotional needs. So if morale is down, what are you going to do as a supervisor to make it better? And I do think that's part of what we have to do, is to try to encourage folks, uh, be as positive as we can, and get them to be positive. And yet we can't deny uh, financial problems, financial difficulties, um, a lot of things that agencies face. An agency may also want you to do unobtrusive supervision. And this really, I think, is a good thing, too. Um, they need to know, as your supervisees, that if they need you, they can get you. So if you're out in one of your 15 counties that you supervise, uh, they can call you and say, I have a suicidal patient in my office. This is what they're saying. I've never done a suicidal patient. What should I do? And you can give support, ideas, suggestions, uh, work with them on that. I think that's very legitimate. Um, and they need to know that both physically and psychologically, you are accessible and approachable. So if somebody calls you on your cell phone and is crying hysterically, you may not recognize who it is at first, but you may have to get where they can talk, and maybe they're telling you uh, a very sad story about a client they just learned has died, uh, or uh, a family situation that they're very upset about, and you can be there and be supportive uh, and very positive ways. You can't fix it. You can't fix a death. You can't uh, make them not have a caseload. But the support, emotional support you give is sometimes all that they need. And then if they need more, they can ask for it. Do they need a day for mental health? Well, if they can't stop crying, that's probably a good thing. And however you can manage that is good. Um, Agency wants you to have positive relationships with your supervisees, communicate really well. Uh, but also, the communication can go both ways. If administration says this is a new policy and they have to do this, then you have to bring that knowledge to the people you supervise. But you also can bring the information to administration about how that new policy is working. 
balancing the needs of the agency as well as the stability means we often have to advocate for the changes that happen in our agencies which can be stressful on us as supervisors. Use authority as needed, but only when necessary. If we can request, if we can suggest, and our supervisees are willing to try something, that's great. Uh, if, but occasionally, I have said, as much as I don't like to be this dogmatic, in future, if you discharge a patient from my hospital, this is what you have to do. And if you don't do that, you will be negligent. That's a tough thing to say, but there are times when that's what you have to say or whatever within your agency setting. Don't get really into power and get where you just think it's so wonderful that you are in your position. That is not going to be helpful to the people you supervise or the agency. Um, Sometimes we have to get informed consent from our supervisees. If we're going to be sitting in, observing them uh, with a client, sometimes I have done a consent, uh, especially if there was concern that they were not interacting well, and this might lead to an eventual problem of their hiring. Uh, you may have something that covers just through the line of supervision where you can do it at ADPH. taking corrective disciplinary action. None of us enjoy doing that, but sometimes if somebody has not complied with the code of ethics or professional standards, now if they're brand new, they've just come out of school and they made a, a mistake, you document it, you teach them, but you don't you know, have to get them fired. But if they work for 30 years and there's a pattern that they do this and it is something that can cause legal issues for the agency, medical problems for the clients, you have to deal with it. Uh, Non-compliance with agency policies and procedures are one of the problems that we have to look at. Uh, you may not like policies and procedures. That's okay. You don't have to like them, but you do have to go along with them. When I was at public health, we occasionally had to report people to uh, the social work board who were doing a behavior that was unethical, uh, inappropriate. I'm sure nurses uh, have had to take the same actions at AT ADPH occasionally for staff. Most of the employees are so honest and are so dependable, it's wonderful. But occasionally we have somebody who falsifies home visits, falsifies uh, costs, things that are just not ethical to do in our profession. Uh, or they decide they would like to date a client that's not ethical in our profession. Uh, so sometimes HIPAA rules are violated. That may be a non-compliance issue. Uh, and so uh, our filing for Medicaid visits that were not made, that is an issue for discipline as well. So all those, you have to mention it when you talk about supervision, not because everybody's doing it, but an occasional time will come. Ethically, Always identify errors made by supervisees. Help them develop their skills and interventions so they don't continue to have errors. Occasionally, we have to reassign a client uh, uh, or transfer them or terminate them based on what has gone on in the medical relationship, the social work relationship with the client. Um, doesn't happen often, but when it does, we certainly need to take appropriate steps. One of the happiest times for me when I supervise is when I see the new employee, the new student recognizes when they need consultation, when they no longer think they can do it all. Then I feel very confident that they will come to me and say, 
I don't know what to do with this client, and I don't have to hang out and hear that. Again, hard to take time to do, but monitor your worker's competence. Address incompetence when you find it. Impairment. If a worker appears to be intoxicated or on drugs, we have to intervene, try to get them assistance. Uh, if it is reported they have taken something from a client, money, uh, something from the home, we have to have that investigated, even if we know uh, it's probably not true. Uh, I have been investigated. One client accused me of stealing her canned green beans out of her house. And although I like canned green beans, I truly did not steal them. But a uh, full investigation was done to make sure I had not stolen from the client and other types of investigations. So we just have to know all of us can be uh, checked to make sure we're not violating our clients in some way. At first it made me mad, but then I decided, you know, isn't it great that we care enough that we don't want people dealing with clients and patients to take advantage of them. Be careful of boundaries between workers and clients. Um, and always, of course, you're reviewing records and paperwork. Wow, so you don't have time to paint fingernails, toenails, anything. You have nine million hours of work to do every day. If your particular discipline requires a certain number of hours, make sure you're doing that, you document it. Avoid dual relationships. You cannot date somebody you supervise. Uh, you don't need to really date somebody in their family. Um, always give good feedback and timely feedback so if they need to make adjustments, they can. Different modalities of supervision, individual, group, and an agency I talked with recently has no supervision. Now, you can imagine my concerns with that, and the MSWs who worked there were rather concerned. Although they had MSWs, they did want to be able to get some interaction going and some questions answered about particular things that they could do. I think at this point we may be out of time. No, we can keep going. We can keep, okay. All right. The benefits of individual supervision. How many of you in here have had individual supervision for licensure or whatever? Okay. So you will know most of these. Um, very confidential. Somebody can say, I don't know what I'm doing with a suicidal patient. Will you help me? They're not as likely to do that in a group of their peers or interdisciplinary groups, so individual for that is excellent. Um, and especially new graduates or new employees seem to do well with the individual. And it allows you to come up with ideas about how this person is functioning and ask them about how would they solve something, and, and you can assess that. Group supervision, everywhere I've ever worked has encouraged this because it's cost effective, time efficient, uh, and there are some positives to it. Uh, it allows the supervisees to learn from each other, to validate the universal learning experiences, and provide support from multiple persons. So if you hear that another RN, another social worker is having trouble, that a client has attempted suicide, you can approach that person and see how are they coping, what things are helpful. Uh, you can get more into common issues and problems. You can have a lot of peer interaction. It helps with group cohesion. And it enables the supervisee to develop group interaction skills. You have to talk in one-on-one -on -one individual supervision. In group, less so. But if you talk with somebody you supervise and say, I notice you're not really speaking up, and I think it would be helpful if you did, and encourage them to, they're going to develop, develop more skills. The disadvantages, you can't individualize things. Uh, it's a problem 
if there's conflict between the employees, you're spending time on the conflict rather than client issues, patient issues. Uh, it's harder on new members. They have more trouble speaking up and getting in the discussion. Um, sometimes in groups, there's some decision making and problem solving where people say, well, the easiest thing is to just cut uh, the time in half so you can see more clients. Well, that may be the easiest thing, but does it actually achieve what we want to with each individual patient or client? Sometimes when multiple sources are given feedback, it's hard for the supervisee to take it all in. And then if they're varying things, because everybody in here, if I gave you a case, you might do something slightly different with a client. None of the things would be wrong, but it has to do a lot of times with your approach, your comfort level with a topic, a million things. So there's no one way to approach a client that's right. Um, sometimes as a supervisor, you have to address things that are being discussed, and you may have a very different opinion from what the supervisees have. You can lose control of a meeting. If you enjoy having control, group supervision is a hard task. Uh, and you have a problem with group think. If the group says, well, this is the easiest or best method, it's hard sometimes for individuals to say, no, that's incorrect. If you are new to supervision, I suggest things like doing a self-assessment, see what type uh, individual you are. One of the techniques we've used in the past has been the Myers-Briggs. You can get that online and do it and assess yourself. And these are the things that looks at everything from introversion, extroversion, to how you make decisions, how you access information from the community. And then a really positive step would be to have some of the people you supervise do this. You have to be aware it's all a positive. There are no negative types. So every type is good. And a lot of times we use this with interdisciplinary teams to see, OK, the reason this person and this person work well together is they're the same type. And the reason these two butt heads is they're opposite types. And sometimes just knowing that can be helpful. Uh, there are other formats you can use, be it eco maps, maps of the world, uh, uh, the meta programs, which includes habits, filters, things that we use. Uh, those are some recent issues that come up. Uh, timelines, uh, looking at the time that you have been born, what are some of the things that have occurred so you will focus on certain issues and your supervisor may focus on others very similar to the generation type idea. Some people are very conscious of time. OK, there's a 9 o'clock meeting. There's a 10 o'clock meeting. Don't forget, we have to leave for lunch right at 11 to get to things. Other people are said to be in time conscious, which means they're so focused on something they're doing, they will continue to work at their computer or wherever. And three hours may go by, and they don't even recognize it. Does that mean they're bad workers? No. They just have a different way that they work. But being aware of that, you as a supervisor can help them make sure they function in the system. Delegation, how do you do that? Why do we do it? It's a way to increase resources, manager's time, responsiveness, the effectiveness of the team, and staff morale. If the supervisor holds everything and does tries to do it all, that tends to make supervisees feel like they're incompetent when that's not the issue. Skills of delegation, you can go through these. Um, I like the coaching, training, and support that it can provide. Matching people to task. If you have somebody who's really good with computer skills, ask if they would do a certain project for you that has that. 
if they're really good with liaisoning with the community, give them something for that. So as a manager, as a supervisor, you know people's strengths and you can get into delegating things they could enjoy, they could do well, and that would help the agency the most. How do we ensure successful delegation? You have to be fully informed of the capability of your staff. If you give a computer project to somebody who's not really good with computers, they're going to feel deflated and you're going to feel badly about the work they give you. Uh, the complexity and the risk of the task. Certain individuals can do multitasking really well, a very big project. Others may want short-term kinds of things that they can shine at. You as a supervisor, you're the insurance policy. You know these people, you know what they can do best. What blocks you to delegation? A lack of knowledge and skill, a lack of self-awareness, Sometimes the organizational culture, in some organizations, if you delegate some things, it's like, well, are you not a good manager? Why didn't you do this? Well, you delegated it because you are a good manager. And by delegating something you know somebody can do, then you can spend more time on some things they may not have access to. Uh, it also is affected by your personal beliefs, your experiences, time, and crises. You know, in a crisis, I can delegate a heck of a lot. Supervision is not consultation. I love consultation jobs. I just get to walk in, do my thing for an hour or two or three or whatever, complete the project, whatever it is, give them the paperwork, and walk out. I'm done. As a supervisor, you have to give recommendations, suggestions, and always have the power factor. If somebody does poorly, then you have to document, you have to put that in evaluation. When I consult, I don't have to do that. I just go in and enjoy. So don't confuse the supervision with the consultation. And the last point is to take time for self-care. If you're a supervisor, you probably don't do this as well as you could or you should because you're managing so many things, you may just want to go home and put your feet up and not do anything. And that's not a bad thing, but what's the stress relievers you do? Spend time in nature, exercise, do something that helps renew your spirit. If you're an introvert, spend time with yourself, read a book, uh, do something independently. If you're an extrovert, you renew yourself by going around more people, doing an activity with friends, relatives, whatever. By knowing yourself well, which you can do by doing the Myers-Briggs, you can know how you can proceed and do the best you can do for yourself, your family, and your agency. Thank you. Y'all have been so attentive and so very participatory for an audience uh, that was getting so much material. Uh, and I appreciate it, and I appreciate the fact that you all are supervisors, and I want you to know I recognize it's a tough job. Keep up the good stuff you're doing, and this could be a PowerPoint you could share with somebody who is a new supervisor to help point out some issues and things for them. Okay, thanks so much. Thank you, Sheila. I appreciate it. And some of the best advice I ever got as a new supervisor was uh, my supervisor told me, you know, you want to be the kind of supervisor that people want to follow, not the kind that they're forced to follow. Yes. And so a lot of your, your information was very, very much in line with that, that thought. I want to thank everyone for joining us today, and uh, we will see you next time on the Alabama Public Health Training Network.